First Kings chapter 2, verse 1 through 11. So thankful that Dan taught this last week on Psalm 39. He spoke about death. We're going to be dealing with it again. It seems that we need to hear it again this week. So we're going to take a look at the death of David. This is the Word of God. As David's time to draw to die drew near, he charged Solomon his son, saying, I am going the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and show yourself a man. Keep the charge of the Lord your God, to walk in His ways, to keep His statutes, His commandments, His ordinances, and His testimonies, according to what is written in the law of Moses, that you may succeed in all that you do and wherever you turn, so that the Lord may carry out His promise, which He spoke concerning me, saying, If your sons are careful of their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. Now you also know what Joab the son of Zariah did to me, and what he did to the two commanders of the armies of Israel, to Abner the son of Ner, and to Amasa the son of Jether, whom he killed. He also shed the blood of war in peace, and he put the blood of war on his belt and about his waist, and on his sandals on his feet. So... Act according to your wisdom, and do not let his gray hair go down to Sheol in peace. But show kindness to the sons of Barzillai the Gileadite, and let them be among those who eat at your table. For they assisted me when I fled from Absalom, your brother. Behold, there is with you Shimei, the son of Gera, the Benjamite of Bahurim. Now it was he who cursed me with a violent curse on the day I went to Mahanaim. But when he came down to me at the Jordan, I swore to him by the Lord, saying, I will not put you to death with a sword. Now, therefore, do not let him go unpunished, for you are a wise man, and you will know what you ought to do to him, and you will bring his gray hair down to Sheol with blood. Then David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. The days that David reigned over Israel were forty years. Seven years he reigned in Hebron, and thirty-three years he reigned in Jerusalem. Now may the Lord bless the reading of His Word and our time in studying it this morning. Let's pray. Well, good morning. As I mentioned earlier, Dan's sermon over Psalm 39 providentially fits this teaching today. Uh, My, the ways of providence. This is literally what I was planning on teaching in my uh, Sunday school class, and it fits just rightly with Psalm 39, verse 5. Surely every man at his best is a mere breath. We find out that David is going to experience that in real time in the passage today. He's coming to the end of his life, and he experiences really another psalm that we probably are more familiar with, Psalm 23, specifically verse 5, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So we're going to see this take place today. The man is on his dying bed. He's speaking to his son, Solomon, who is about to take over the reins of power. What's he going to tell him? What will you one day say? Something worth begging the question about. Not only that, but the problem is, is most of us don't know when we're going to die. Very few of us perhaps get deathbed experiences. Sometimes it's from an accident, um, some tragedy of some kind. What will you say? What goes through your mind, last fleeting moments? Let's get a picture in the life of David. Chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. As David's time to, dr- to die drew near, he charged Solomon his son, saying, I am going the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and show yourself a man. In the Hebrew, it doesn't say time, as David's time. It says literally, as David's days drew near. And that fits appropriately with Psalm 90, does it not? Verse 10, where Moses writes by inspiration of the Spirit, as for the days of our life, they contain 70 years, or if by reason of strength 80, yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. Although some die later 
than 80 or 70, and yet sometime much earlier. Martin Lloyd-Jones from the English pulpit of the 19th century, 20th century, says, the moment you come into this world, you are beginning to go out of it. I think it was age 27, I was at a Nashville conference with some other Christian school educators, a man about 15 years older than me. I was talking with him. Dr. Shorter was his name, nice guy. And he liked to tease a lot. And he was joking with me about something I can't remember. And he looked at me and he said, you've got lines around your eyes. You're only 27. And I laughed. And I thought, he's not kidding. <laughs> and I went to look at the mirror and I think, oh my goodness, I'm dying. It just occurred to me. <laughs> Please, teenagers, do not wait till 27 to realize you're dying. You come into the world dying. And so David says that. He says that the time is up, and I'm going the way of all the earth. <coughs> interesting thing about death, interesting is probably not the right word, horrifying, horrifying thing about death. It's no respecter of persons. With all of us being children of Adam, we know that death becomes us. David states this really as a universal principle. And yet I've heard people say before, you know, death is, is really just part of life. I would really propose that death is in reality an enemy of life. It wasn't with us at the beginning. And it's a fact of life due to the curse of sin. Thankfully for believers, it will one day be extinct. And that's an encouraging thought. We look forward to the day of death because that will be straight into heaven. And yet be careful especially for some of the older people perhaps here today, don't be too eager for death. To quote George Whitfield, he said, Lord, keep me from a sinful and too eager desire for death. I desire not to be impatient. I wish quietly to wait until my blessed change comes. And yet most of us, if we're honest, we don't long for that day. We're scared of death, perhaps the way a little child is scared of the darkness. We know it's coming. We still like to think about it. And yet, what does he tell Solomon, his son? He says, be strong, therefore, and show yourself a man. And, and literally, what it says in the, in the Hebrew, uh, be strong, therefore, and become a man. As a kid playing football, perhaps some of you can relate to this, I would sometimes uh, be out playing and then land wrong, and then you, you get the breath knocked out of you. That's always so discouraging for a kid because all the boys circle around you and look down and you're trying to tell them something's wrong, but all you can say is, oh, oh. and what you hear the kids say is they would say, come on, shake it off, be a man. I had no idea they were speaking biblical terminology. <laughs> be a man. Uh, that's interesting. There is, a gen, there is a theology of gender that many believers didn't think we'd ever need until the time period that we now live. The theology of gender is good. The point is there are differences in the sexes and is a gift of God. It's really lined out in a couple places of Scripture. 1 Corinthians 16, 13, Paul says, Be on the alert. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. What characteristic is typically associated with man? Strength. Yet Paul's command in 1 Corinthians 16 is given to the men and women of Corinth. And the encouragement he's trying to tell them is you folks need to be strong. Certainly a woman can be strong. Yet when you think of the two genders, you think of a man when considering the term strength. And rightfully so, according to the Bible. You also have another verse, 1 Thessalonians 2, 7, that speaks of this theology of gender, where Paul will say, We prove to be gentle among you, as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Well, then begs the question, are women the only ones who are gentle? Of course not. Christ himself describes uh, himself in Matthew 9, uh, 11, 29, that he is gentle and lowly at heart. 
When Paul is writing this to the Thessalonians, he's describing himself and fellow male ministers as gentle. Certainly, men can be gentle, tender, and caring. Yet when you think of a woman, in particular a nursing mother, you think of one who is gentle, tender, and caring, and rightfully so. Some may object. That's just a stereotype. It's a generalization. I would agree with you. It's, it's, it's not always exact, but most of the times it is true to form. You see, this is the way that God made each gender. Instead of fighting these characteristics the way our society does, we should celebrate them as part of the Lord's good design for the flourishing of His creation. We certainly should also beware of straying into some sort of unbiblical generalization that demeans men or women. But where the Bible uses this language in the description of the sexes, we should embrace it, celebrate the differences, and praise the Lord for it. And that's what David is doing here. He's looking at his son, be strong. Show yourself a man. And note what he says next, and perhaps one of the most important parts, verse 3 and 4. Keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in His ways, to keep His statutes, His commandments, His ordinances, and His testimonies, according to what is written in the law of Moses, that you may succeed in all that you do, and wherever you turn, so that the Lord may carry out His promise which He spoke concerning me, saying, If your sons are careful of their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. So what David gets to the crux of the matter, and he says, Solomon, the best way I can prepare you is to say, You keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in His ways. And now he mentions statutes, commandments, ordinances, and testimonies. Those are all different precepts about the Mosaic law. And so he's telling Solomon the king's main goal here is to set the example as the Lord's representative among the people. That's your job, Solomon. Dr. Johnson does a really good sermon on this text, and he says regarding this, that is a lesson that we need today. Now, we may modify it. We in the New Testament live after the coming of our Lord. We lived after the doing away of the Mosaic law as a code, but not of the moral law itself as found in that code, because the apostles repeat the essence of it in the New Testament in their exhortations to us. So that's what we live according to. Sadly, many evangelicals today have imperceptibly traded in the rich authority of the Word of God for shallow self-help philosophies. Holding to the unadulterated Word of God has become so unpopular today, ladies and gentlemen, to the effect that even professing believers now go to the world for help instead of the God of the universe who has given everything we need for life and godliness according to His Word. That's our foundation. So as David speaks to him, he says, let me tell you, son, I'm going to tell you the result of walking in the Lord's ways. He tells them that you may succeed in all that you do and wherever you turn so that the Lord may carry out his promise that he has spoke concerning me. First off, he tells Solomon, Psalm 1, in essence, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but what? His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in His law He meditates day and night. He would be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. But what? The wicked are not so. He's telling Solomon, this is your way of success, son. You need to listen to me. Well, he goes further with this, and he also brings up a conditional aspect of the unconditional covenant that, that David himself has received. I think you saw it, didn't you? Take a look. Verse 4, If your sons are careful of their way to walk before me in truth, with all their heart, with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. David is taking Solomon back to 2 Samuel 7. 
He received an unconditional covenant. What is an unconditional covenant? It's unconditional. It doesn't depend upon you at all. The promise would be fulfilled no matter what. David, you will be the kingly line. One day the Messiah will come from you and his kingdom will have no end. There is no end to the Davidic kingship. But there's one condition in that unconditional aspect. I think you know it here. One part of that covenant was conditional in order for David's descendants to continually rule in an unbroken pattern. They had to be faithful to the Lord in His Word. If not, they were removed from the office. Now, be careful here. I'm not saying the dynasty would end. No, the dynasty is forever, and it concludes in the person of Jesus Christ, who we wait for one day to reign and rule on this earth. But there were times that the Lord pulled out those Davidic kings if they were wicked, and the reign wouldn't continue at that particular time period. So that's what He tells him. This is the way to move forward, Solomon. Now, verse 5 and following, David tells Solomon, uh, we need to deal with some of your characters in your story, Solomon. You're going to have to deal with them pretty soon. Take a look, verse 5 and 6. Now, you also know what Joab, the son of Zariah, did to me, what he did to the two commanders of the armies of Israel, to Abner, the son of Ner, and to Amasa, the son of Jether, whom he killed. He also shed the blood of war in peace. And he put the blood of war on his belt about his waist and on his sandals on his feet. So act according to your wisdom and do not let his gray hair go down to Sheol or the place of the dead in peace. Here we find out there's some unfinished business that Solomon is going to have to deal with. David, we'll see this first man David should have dealt with. Uh, a man named Joab. Joab is one of the sons of Zariah. That may not mean anything to you, but Zariah is one of David's two sisters. There's a few different times in 1 and 2 Samuel where David is quoted as saying, What have I to do with you, O sons of Zariah? He'll also add, You sons of Zariah are too difficult for me. What was so difficult about these guys? Well, I guess it would be like having linebackers serving communion. These guys would eat children for breakfast. They, um, they were great, fierce warriors, Joab, Abishai, Asahel, but they were way too impetuous. And Joab, the oldest brother, had a penchant for revenge in being in charge. Sadly, David did not punish Joab in particular, and we see really the reason why is that he was general David wasn't certain if he could reign without him. There seems to be questions in his mind as he deals with that. And so he says, Solomon, it's on your shoulders. And the reason why he really needs to deal with him, it's seen clearly in the text. This man, Joab, shed the blood of war in peace. That means the men he killed, he didn't kill in battle. He killed in cold blood, murdering them. And it's interesting, he says, he put the blood of war on his belt, about his waist, and on his sandals, on his feet. And the idea is that he flaunted it in a, in a sort of uh, figurative way. But there's also a literalness in this, because we find out the two men that he killed, he killed them at such a short uh, distance between the two of them that in all likelihood he did have blood all over himself at the time of their deaths. What did he do to these two commanders? One of them was Abner. Abner was general of Ishbosheth's army. Ishbosheth was the last surviving son of Saul, who ruled briefly after the time of Saul. In 2 Samuel 3, Joab took Abner aside as if to speak to him privately, and then he stabbed him in the stomach. We also have Amasa. Amasa was general of Absalom's army, but he was also first cousin of Joab. It's his first cousin. 2 Samuel 20, Joab tells Amasa, he comes up to him, he says, it is, is it well with you, my brother? And then he took him by the beard as if to kiss him, and with his other hand, stabbed him in the belly. This man is ruthless. And so, did you note, though, what David refers to in the pronoun? He doesn't say so much that Joab did to these men, although he mentions it. He said, this Joab did to me. He did it to me when he did that. 
See, as Joab persecuted the king's subjects, so he persecuted the king. And some of you Bible scholars know exactly where I'm going. In Acts 9.40, rather verse 4, where Christ himself, the son of David, says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Though Saul had never seemed to have met the Lord Jesus Christ in the flesh before that day, the Lord told him, by you persecuting my people, you persecute me. So, continuing on, he tells him, Act according to your wisdom, Solomon. Do not let his gray hair go down to Sheol in peace. What is he crying out for in one word? Justice. Justice must take place in this man's life. You see, time does not wash away sin. I've, uh, as you have, I'm sure, witnessed to different people about the gospel, and I would encourage you, before you give them the good news, you, you have to give them the bad news that they are lost in their sin. And be careful because there's some people out there today that actually don't think they're sinners at all. Or their sin is so far back. The Lord will forgive that. I mean, come on, I was stealing crayons in the kindergarten. That doesn't count. And I would tell you, no. Actually, God is ever-present. And because we have a God who is, does not die, but He was with you at those particular times, He doesn't overlook your sin. And if you think about it, in our own society, in our own world, the Nazis that killed and exterminated the Jews that escaped to South America. You remember hearing of their stories in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, even in the 90s, where they would arrest these men. I hope you weren't one of those people that said, well, come on, they committed those heinous crimes decades ago. Let them off. No, you realize there's something vitally important within your soul about justice. It must be done. And ladies and gentlemen, justice must be done to you as well, unless someone has taken your place. So he says, give it to him. Verse 7, we have a good character here, not Joab. He, he says, but show kindness to the sons of Barzillai the Gileadite, and let them be among those who eat at your table. For they assisted me when I fled from Absalom, your brother. Second character or characters he speaks of are, should be rewarded for their faithfulness to the king. They assisted me when I fled from your traitorous brother, Absalom. You see, Barzillai and his son supported David and his men when they were run out of Jerusalem. Uh, this sort of information uh, or helpfulness is found in the New Testament as well. Romans 16, 3 and 4, where Paul can say, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Jesus Christ, who for my life risked their own necks. You see, by Barzillai bringing in David and taking care of him, he's signing the death warrant for himself and his sons if David loses this, uh, this war between he and uh, Absalom. Same thing for Paul. These people are risking their necks for the sake of the gospel. Do we have other stories like that in church history? Well, I'm glad you asked. Frederick III of Saxony in modern-day Germany, he is remembered for his protection of Martin Luther. He ensured that Luther be given safe passage to and from the Diet of Worms. And you may say, what is that? Well, you remember that meeting. That's where Luther made it very clear to the Holy Roman Empire, I am bound by the Scriptures. Faith alone, I cannot, and he goes further, and I will not recant. And at that point, he has a price on his head. The Holy Roman Emperor called for Luther's arrest. It became a crime for anyone in Germany to give Luther food or shelter. And they put forth another interesting law that they permitted anyone to kill Luther without any punishment whatsoever. So you can murder him in cold blood and it wouldn't matter. Frederick had Luther kidnapped on the highway back to Wittenberg, where he hid him in the Wartburg Castle, and Luther was provided with transcripts. What were those transcripts? It was the Greek. And basically what Frederick said is, I saved you. Now you take that Greek and translate it into German. He translated the scriptures into the German. And we're so thankful for that. Wow. I, I wonder, in this 21st century that we live, for ourselves, is there a time coming where we ourselves may risk our necks 
in order to, tr to be a true follower of Jesus Christ and his people. Could the Lord one day call us to that? Certainly. And he does throughout the history of the church. Verse 8 and 9. Behold, here's our another character. Behold, there is with you Shimei, the son of Gera, the Benjamite of Behurim. Now it was he who cursed me with a violent curse on the day I went to Mahanaim. But when he came down to me at the Jordan, I swore to him by the Lord, saying, I will not put you to death with a sword. Now, therefore, do not let him go unpunished, for you are a wise man, and you will know what you ought to do to him, and you will bring his gray hair down to Sheol with blood. First person, Joab. Second person, Barzillai and his sons. Third person, Shimei. Who is Shimei? Well, when David was run out of Jerusalem, this Benjamite threw rocks at he and his men and cursed them violently. When David came back to the city, one of the sons of Zariah told David to kill Shimei. Kill him. <laughs> and David says, what do I have to do with you, sons of Zariah? And he gives him mercy. But listen to me, folks. In the Mosaic law, it's against the law to curse the king. David gives him mercy at the moment. But he tells Solomon, don't let him go unpunished. It's almost like David is saying, by the way, Shimei, I never promised my successor wouldn't kill you. And uh, he tells him to use wisdom in this. Because ultimately, I think we'll see that David doesn't think Shimei's a changed man. He thinks he may cause his son trouble again. And you'll have to read more in the book of Kings to find out how that works out. He says, don't let him go unpunished. And then he says, for you are a wise man. You will know what you ought to do. Uh, some of us are of the view that Solomon only received wisdom after the Lord asked him, uh, how can I bless you in a dream? But we see here the Lord had even given him wisdom even beforehand. Solomon is only 20 years old. And you'd say, what happened there? Well, remember, the fear of the Lord is the gift of God. And not only is the fear of the Lord a gift of God, it's also the what? Beginning of wisdom. That's where it first starts. If you don't have that, you don't have wisdom. That's the foundation. We see that in Proverbs 1.7 where Solomon writes that. And yet, not to delve too much into the life of Solomon, but has Solomon ever proven to be a mystery to you? Out of all the peoples of Scripture, perhaps he is the biggest conundrum for me. He's born the son of David, a man of God's own heart. God gives him the nickname, Jedediah, loved of the Lord. He's wise even at age 20. The Lord appears to him a dream, and Solomon doesn't ask for great riches or any of these other things, but he asks for wisdom, that he, would, that he would be able to shepherd God's people well. So the question I ask is, why does the wisest man on earth die a fool? How does that happen? Well, we see 1 Kings 11:4. when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away from after other gods, and his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. So you'd say the many wives that he had. But then there's another question for me underneath that. Why was he drawn towards that? I mean, he was so wise. Uh, I asked Dr. Walkie that a couple of years ago in uh, Seattle. I just said, what's your thoughts on that? He's just so disturbing of a character. Not that we couldn't do the same, of course. And he, his thoughts were, led me to Proverbs 19.27 uh, when Dr. Walkie had said, you know, I've, I've wondered about that too. And Proverbs 19.27 might give us a small light into a dark room where he says, cease listening, my son, to discipline or correction or instruction, and you will stray from the words of knowledge. So perhaps the way it was is Solomon is the wisest man on the earth, and he knows it. And then he stopped listening. Well, David tells him, you do what's right. Verse 10 and 11, Then David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. The days that David reigned over Israel were 40 years Seven years he reigned in Hebron, and 33 years he reigned in Jerusalem. And David slept. Aren't you thankful for that word if you're a believer? Certainly David did die in the flesh. Let's not back away from that. And you will die, as I will, unless the Lord should return. 
beforehand, but he slept. Acts 7, we see this again. As Stephen was being stoned to death, he cries out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. You see, when a believer dies, when a believer in Jesus Christ dies, his immaterial soul goes to heaven and his body goes to sleep. I know perhaps uh, you could go back in a memory as way far back for some of you older people. And you remember when you were a child and the first time you saw the person in the coffin. And they looked just asleep. It was so strange. And it's supposed to be that way. It's meant to be that way. You see, inherently, we know something about sleeping. At least, I'd like to think I know something about sleeping when I go to sleep at night. Inherently, I'm going to get back up again. I'm going to rise up again. Hopefully, I won't have to rise up too many times in the middle of the night. But I'm going to get up eventually. And I'll, I'll be refreshed. And things will be better. And certainly, that's symbolically a picture of our own resurrection. What a great comfort in the term sleep. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In Acts 13.36, we see that uh, Paul says, For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep. And I'm, I'm thankful for really both sides of that verse. And I think you caught it. Number one, once he served the purposes of God. Folks, the only reason that you are alive right now at 1116 on January 8th on Sunday is at this very moment you're serving the purposes of God. And at the very millisecond that you stop serving the purposes of God that He has for you, He will take you home. So be encouraged. He's not done with you yet. Number two, he says he fell asleep. And so if it's true of David that once he served the purposes of God and then he fell asleep, that's certainly true for believers as well. But the great thing about that is the immaterial part of us, the soul, will not sleep. It's very clear at the point of death, we will be in our soul more alive than we ever could have dreamed of being here on this earth. Philippians 1.23, Paul is in some ways deciding, not that he can decide, but he's kind of debating back and forth where God can best use him, knowing that ultimately the Lord is sovereign in this. But he says in Philippians 1.23, I'm hard-pressed from both directions, whether to stay here or depart and be with Christ. And he says, having the desire to depart and be with Christ for that is far better, far better. So David departs, and we see his physical aspect. He is buried in the city of David. Now, I had never heard of this aspect before, and so I'll share it with you as I studied it. The tomb of David may well have never been found, but it was well known at that particular time period. Josephus wrote in his book, Antiquities of the Jews, that Solomon buried much treasure in David's tomb where it stayed untouched for 900 years. At that time, Israel was besieged by Antiochus uh, Epiphanes. Uh, they called him Antiochus Epiphanes, which was coming of the glorious one, but the Jews called him Antiochus Epimenes, uh, the appearing of the madman. And Hyrcanus, the high priest at that time, opened up one room of that sepulcher and took out 3,000 talents, part of which he gave to Antiochus to stop the siege. Later on in that first century B.C., Herod the Great ransacked the tomb and got more of the riches out. The tomb of David is still noted in Acts 2.29, where Peter tells the Jews that David's tomb is with us today. A few hundred years after that, Jerome himself writes of David's tomb. However, something changed. You see, in the ninth century, the Muslims living in Jerusalem said that David's tomb was located on Mount Zion, which is outside the city walls, which does not accord with Scripture. I've seen the location, yet most archaeologists don't believe that is the actual location. Perhaps we're still waiting for the tomb of David to be found. Well, I digress. After reigning 40 years, David dies. 
It's interesting because Solomon, or rather Moses writes 70, or if by strength 80, and how old is David? 70. The years of our life are 70, or if by reason of strength, 80. What am I saying? You just don't know when the Lord will take you. Dan said it so well last week. God has ordained life to be short and vain in order to show men that life ends and man's achievements come to nothing, that our hope is not in this world. So I'd like to give you a few quotations and a verse and we'll close up today. These quotes are from the last few hundred years of some godly men um, who have dealt with death. And some of the quotes I thought were just so encouraging. I found these, I'd like to share them with you. Thomas Brooks, one of the Puritans said, it is no credit to your heavenly father for you to be loathed to go home. Point, if you really love your dad that much, you want to go, you want to, go to him. Adoniram Judson, famous missionary, American missionary to Burma, said this, When Christ calls me home, I shall go with the gladness of a boy bounding away from school. Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon said, The best moment of a Christian's life is his last one, because it is the one that is nearest heaven. And then perhaps my favorite, Matthew Henry's, he whose head is in heaven need not fear to put his feet into the grave. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ today, you can bank on this. Colossians 3, 3 and 4, your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life is revealed, then you will also be revealed with him in glory. The point is you are not yourself. You have been bought with a price. You belong to Christ. And if you will, it's like he has hidden you in the coat of his garment. And you're with him. And all that the Father, Jesus says, give, will, gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Some of you that have, that have had nightmares about losing salvation. I'll tell you today, you can lose your salvation if you gained it. But if you didn't gain it, you can't lose it, right? I mean, this is not rocket science, right? You're with me, aren't you? No, Christ saved you. Christ gained the salvation for you. You can't lose it. But I will tell you this, there's some people in here that are not yet in Christ. You've not yet come to the place of trusting Christ for your salvation. Your, your future dooms darkness. And my encouragement to you is come to the cross today. Come to the great shepherd of the sheep. Jesus himself says, come to me, all who are weary and burned. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I'm gentle and humble at heart. You will find rest for your souls. Charles Spurgeon put it this way. He who does not prepare for death is more than an ordinary fool. He is a madman. Don't be that person today. At this time, let me have you arise as we sing from the white hymnal, hymn number 40, Arise My Soul. Father, we thank you for the great shepherd of the sheep that gladly laid down his life for his children. Father, we can come before you with confidence that we can bring all of our, all of our cares before you because he, you care for us. We can even call you Abba, Father, and cry out to you today. Father, we pray for the believers in here that you would just grant them a steadfastness in doing that. Only you can do that, Father. Please grant that we would be praying people, that we would pour out our hearts before you, begging you for mercy, thanking you for it, praying for others. And Lord, I do pray for anybody in here who does not yet know the great shepherd of the sheep. Lord, reveal them even this moment what a great shepherd he is, that he would gladly give it for your people. And Father, I now pray for the folks. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of that great shepherd of the sheep, Jesus Christ, amen.